This is episode 77, where I'm going to highlight five common training errors that increase your injury risk so you can train smarter and get better results. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Strength Running Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Fitzgerald, and it's usually my job on this show to interview high-level runners, coaches, authors, nutritionists, scientists, and other experts to help you improve your running. But today, you're only going to hear from me. I want to share with you a few of the most common training errors that I've seen runners make since I started coaching back in 2010. And I think this is going to be interesting because I have this really interesting different job than many other coaches out there. I coach virtually and have a really big running blog. So I get to talk with a lot of runners every single day. And rather than working with a small group of, say, 10 to 20 runners, I can work with hundreds of runners and have direct conversations with even more. And so this lets me speak at scale with tens of thousands of runners every year and see how they're training, what they're thinking about, how they're setting goals, what goals they make, why they make the training decisions that they do and what motivates them. And for an amateur psychologist like me, I love this. This is like walking through a marathon expo and talking to 50 runners every day about what they're doing. So with that said, I want to share some of the big trends that I'm seeing in the running community on the topic of injuries and how to design training that helps you stay healthy. And let's start with a little pop quiz. Do you know why most runners get injured? When I surveyed my Twitter audience recently, I was surprised by some of the responses. Now, to answer this question, many runners are going to go through a laundry list of issues that might cause an injury. I wore the wrong pair of shoes. I went out too fast in my last park run. I stayed out too late. I didn't stay hydrated. I visualized the wrong thing. But none of those things are why you're probably getting injured. For the vast majority of runners, these are not the factors that cause injury. Not even close. The real reason is what my college cross-country coach Jim Butler called the three twos. Running too much mileage, too soon before you're ready, at too fast a pace. In other words, injuries are caused by training errors. Do the wrong thing over a prolonged period of time, and you can rest assured that you're probably going to get hurt. So here's a great example from outside the running world. Recently, I interviewed Stacy Artisan in our monthly interview series for Team Strength Running about weightlifting. She's become a very competitive power lifter over the last couple of years, and uh, I asked her about injuries in the weight room. What causes them? How do you stay healthy when you're lifting? Her answer was surprising. It wasn't a neat new trick or a fancy wrist strap for deadlifts. It had nothing to do with what shoes you're wearing. In fact, she frequently lifts barefoot. Or whether or not you're wearing compression socks. None of those things matter too much. Her answer was this not doing things correctly. Don't ego lift. How simple and also how accurate. In the sport of weightlifting, just like in running, injuries are caused by doing things you're not prepared to do. And I want to provide a little bit more detail on and examples of these training errors. So let's dive into the top five mistakes we make as runners. Number one, training error number one is when your weekly mileage is skyrocketing. Most runners, I think, understand intellectually that you shouldn't increase your mileage too quickly. If you do that, you're going to introduce a lot of stress, and your body simply can't keep up if you're adding miles too quickly. You're a human, not a machine, after all. And while you're perfectly capable of building endurance and speed and strength, it just doesn't happen in a week or two. This process does take months and years. But let's be honest, we've all done this. You know, the race we have on the schedule is fast approaching and oops, we're not quite prepared yet. So we jack up our long run and hope for the best. But this almost always leads to this vicious cycle of never ending injuries, missed races, and a lot of disappointment. It's inevitable. Because after all, rush training is risky training. So before you register for your next race, figure out where your fitness level is right now where it needs to be at the time of your race, and how realistic it is for you to get from where you are now to where you need to be on race day, because then you can plan your training 
much more effectively. All right, training error number two, you're running too fast. I see this one almost every day. I bet you, yes, you listening right now are probably running some of your mileage at a pace that's simply too aggressive. Now, a helpful tool like a running calculator is going to be able to tell you what your easy paces should be based on your race performances, because that's what easy runs are. They're basically a low percentage of your maximum ability. In other words, you have to earn fast training paces by racing fast first. Without faster races, you have to slow down. So here are a few examples based on where you might be in the half marathon. So if you've run, let's say, a two hour and 15 minute half marathon, your easy pace range is probably gonna be about 1030 to 1130 per mile. A two hour half marathoner is gonna have an easy pace of 930 to 1030 per mile. A 150 half marathoner might be about 845 to 945. If you're running an, an hour 40 for your half, You're probably about 8.15 to 9.15 for your easy running pace. And then if you're running an hour and a half or 90 minutes for your half marathon, your easy pace range is likely about 7.30 to 8.30 per mile. Now, you might be asking why this range is fairly wide. That's because sometimes you feel tired or sore, and it's okay to run on the slow end of this range. Faster is not necessarily better. The slower end of your easy pace range is also best thought of as your recovery pace, while the faster end of this range is what your standard easy pace is. And when in doubt, just run a little bit slower. You're not going to lose any fitness, but you will dramatically reduce your injury risk. Training error number three, no training variety. Now, when we think about injuries, we have to really categorize them as repetitive stress injuries. That's what they technically are. They're the result of a relatively small stressor applied relentlessly over and over again. Here's a good example. You might pronate a little more than you should. This doesn't really become a problem until you start running for more than four to five hours per week. At that point, your feet are going to start to get sore. Your arch and plantar fascia might become tight, especially in the morning when you first get out of bed. Your mobility will decrease, and then your risk of actually getting plantar fasciitis increases dramatically. So how do we conquer this obstacle? How do we allow this hypothetical runner to train more and reduce this repetition of training? Well, there's not much we can do to limit the repetition of running. Our sport consists of one simple movement after all, running straight ahead as hard as you can go. But there are some small ways to mitigate this stress and limit it from causing too many overuse injuries. Now, a few of my favorite examples are rotating, two to three pairs of running shoes. So this helps ensure our feet and lower legs experience varying stress while running because every pair of shoes has a different stack height, a different amount of arch support, a different heel toe drop, different foam material used in the shoe's sole. And by rotating through our shoes, we're gonna slightly vary the stress that our feet and lower legs experience and reduce the repetition of training. Another thing that I love to do is performing strength workouts in mobility routines. These routines are going to force us to move differently. They're going to force us to move in different planes of motion, in more exaggerated ranges of motion, and this is all going to help us develop more movement fluency, become a better athlete, develop more coordination. All of that is going to help us prevent injuries. You can also run a variety of paces throughout the week rather than the same pace over and over again because our mechanics are different with different paces. As you can imagine, you're gonna look very different running five minute mile pace compared to 12 minute mile pace. And finally, one of my favorite ways to limit the repetition of running is to run more trails. Trails change the mechanics of how our feet impact the ground, and trails, I think, are the ultimate addition of variety into any running plan. And with a properly structured program, You're going to vary the distance, the pace, and the overall effort throughout your training. Then smaller changes like shoes and extra mobility work can be implemented on top of that plan. If you're not sure how to structure your own program, we have a lot of options for you at strengthrunning.com slash coaching. So be sure to check out that page if you're still not really sure what to do. All right, let's move on to training error number four, but I want it now. We're all a little impatient, are we? And impatience can be a virtue. 
It can light a fire under your ass and drive you to succeed and push you to be better, but it can also push you to run too much, too soon, too fast. Since running is a long-term sport that requires a long-term outlook, you have to be patient. Let me introduce you to the mindset of one of the best college coaches ever, University of Colorado at Boulder cross-country coach Mark Wetmore. Asked about his secret weapon, this was his reply. Quote, we don't have any secret weapons. The cornerstone of our program is the long-term, patient development of the aerobic metabolism. End quote. Coach Wetmore knows that distance runners get faster when they harness higher and higher levels of endurance. But it takes time to build endurance. And with a patient approach to training, you won't rush your training to get ready for an upcoming race. This mindset is so valuable. Just imagine all the scenarios where this principle will save you from injuries. Take a listen to some of the goals that runners have told me recently. I'd like to race a marathon in 10 weeks, but my current long run is only six miles. My running club was doing 10 by 400 meters, so I thought I could too. My half marathon PR is two hours and 15 minutes, but I'd like to train for a sub four marathon. I've been struggling with running consistency, but I promised my friends I'd do this Ragnar relay and the list could go on. Instead of making these types of poor training decisions, having more patience will give you the perspective needed to slow down and actually do less. One of my favorite maxims is, when in doubt, sit it out. You'll be a healthier and ultimately faster runner when you exercise the discipline to live to run another day. Now, I'm definitely biased, but a helpful way to accomplish this is by hiring a running coach. A good coach is going to be able to provide that perspective and guide you in the most productive direction for you. Okay, our final training error, not doing any strength training. Because weak runners are usually injured runners, and a foundation of strength makes running a lot easier, this is an important one. Just consider the benefits of adding strength workouts to your training. You're more resilient to training errors, so even if you do make a mistake like we've been talking about, you might not get hurt. Strength training is like an insurance policy, just in case. Stronger leg muscles are also able to better withstand the impact forces that travel up your legs from running downhill or on hard surfaces like concrete. And also, your capacity for a higher workload is increased, making mileage and intensity increases far more manageable. In other words, strength training improves your training capacity, and more training is the best way to improve. Strength training is so important that I don't even consider it cross-training. I don't like to call it cross-training. It's simply part of your training as a runner. And if I were to design the ideal strength program for distance runners, it would include several pieces. Number one, runner-specific core routines, because a singular focus on abs is just not enough. Body weight strength routines that focus on the hips and glutes, two muscles that are critical not only for preventing injuries, but also for performance. These are the muscles that power your stride. And finally, two formal weightlifting workouts per week in the gym, focusing on strength and power. This approach aids recovery, it improves strength, develops power, increases speed, and prevents injuries. There's not much better than that for distance runners. If you can avoid these mistakes that we've talked about here on this episode, and then implement the suggestions from more variety to strength training to having more patience and making sure your easy runs are truly, truly easy, you'll be well on your way to running stronger and healthier than ever before. And if you can string together a full one to two years of consistent training, you'll absolutely smash your current personal bests. Now, I understand that I don't have all the answers. I think it's best to hear from a variety of experts in the running industry on how best to prevent injuries. That's why I invited an orthopedist on the show to talk about injury prevention for kids, or I spoke with another coach about keeping bigger runners healthy. And it's why learning from elite runners can be so valuable. I mean, these are the runners who are putting in 100 or 120 miles per week. They're the ones running the longest, fastest, grueling workouts and suffering through some of the most challenging ultra marathons on the planet. The insights from the world's best can help steer us in the right direction and focus our energy on what actually works. 
That's why last year I interviewed nine elite athletes on their favorite injury prevention strategies, and I put it all together for you, and you can download the whole thing for free. I call it the little black book of prevention and recovery, and you can get it at strengthrunning.com slash elites. It includes advice from rock stars like Olympian Dathan Ritzenhain, who previously held the American 5K record, multiple Leadville Trail 100 winner Ian Sharman, world's toughest mutter champ Amelia Boone, David Roche, who is a Nike-sponsored trail runner, Kelly O'Mara, she's a professional triathlete, Joseph Gray and Andy Wacker, these are two of the best mountain runners in the country. There's Devin Yanko, another premier ultramarathon runner who's won the Leadville 100. And then there's Max King, who's qualified for the Olympic trials in everything from the 3,000-meter steeplechase to the marathon. He's won U.S. titles in ultramarathon distances. That's what I love about these runners is they're all focusing on different things, from trails to ultramarathons to the track or even triathlon. Despite their differences, there are strong unifying themes throughout all of their answers. And I also want you to notice what they don't recommend, because that's a good sign if it's a waste of your time. Go ahead and download a copy at strengthrunning.com slash elites if you haven't already, and I'll send that right over to you. And finally, I want to thank all of you for listening, for rating this show and reviewing it on Apple Music, and for all of your emails telling me how you've put some of these principles into action in your training and are experiencing great results. I'm so glad this podcast is actively helping you improve, and I can't wait for the next 77 episodes. Until next time, everyone, run strong.